Hi all, thanks for tuning into the Eamblichus Reading Group. We're covering Eamblichus' thoughts on divine possession tonight. Ryan and I have both experienced various degrees of possession. His have been positive, providing anecdotal proof to Eamblichus' ideas. As we know, Eamblichus places special emphasis on personal experience, and the experiences that Ryan and I share show the value of Eamblichus' thought. Even though some of my experiences were negative, that just opens the door to the question about other types of possession. It's another exciting adventure into the occult. Hope you find it worth your listen. Hi everyone, thanks for joining the February 29th leap year version of the Iamblichus reading group. Uh, we have a short crew on today, it's Ryan and me. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, maybe a short discussion, but uh, we'll try to get into it as much as we can, about um, Iamblichus' uh, ideas on possession, um, mostly divine possession, although he does have some things about um, demonic possession, but we'll take that up next time. Um, so let me start out with some uh, brief remarks. Uh, in the previous session, we discussed the Amblichus' thoughts on prophetic dreams. We saw how he wants to separate out these dreams from common everyday dreams. He provides an example in hypnagogic dreams experiences where the sleeper seems awake but in a different reality and sees strange and marvelous events unfold before their eyes. By now we're familiar with the main thesis in Iamblichus's Egyptian mysteries. The gods are behind every true theurgic experience. We can experience extraordinary things, but if they not, are not inspired by or have their influence on the gods, they are not true and authentic theurgic events. In tonight's reading, he carries on that thread, but we move from the world of dreams and into the light of day, or at least the semblance of day. We also begin to delve into the fascinating, if somewhat disturbing, phenomenon of divine possession. The famous Renaissance occultist Giordano Bruno wrote about magic, in which he tries to discriminate between the magical and the demonic. For Bruno, any time we are talking about the loss of personal identity or self-consciousness, we are talking about demonic possession. Iamblichus would not agree with his Brunonian assertion. Iamblichus does believe in the total possession by a god, and as such, it is not a bad or demonic, at least in the terms of devilish, experience, as Bruno says, but a sign of supernatural grace and blessing from the gods. To be touched by the gods is to be transported into the divine reality, participating wholly and purely. Iamblichus provides several well-known examples from his time and place. The Corbiantes were perhaps the most famous. In celebration and fealty to the great mother goddess Sibylle, they would be transported into her reality as they walked on coals or slashed themselves with knives. We have examples of possession from our own time. You have perhaps seen pictures or films of possessed voodoo participants, or maybe you have seen the Shiite mourners of Ali cutting themselves. For Iamblichus, these are signs of individuals being transported beyond the mortal boundaries of flesh and blood and into the world beyond the senses. The types of physical injury he describes actually indicate, he says, that the individual is possessed by something divine. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to withstand the pain and suffering. It's important to place what Iamblichus says here in the context of Plato's theory of mania. For Plato, there are four types of mania. 
which he says, For if there were a simple fact that insanity is an evil, the saying would be true. But in reality, the greatest of blessings come to us through madness, when it is sent as a gift of the gods. Some scholars don't think the word should be translated as insanity as it is here. A more accurate English translation is transport or rapture. The four kinds of rapture include the erotic from Aphrodite, telestic from Dionysus, prophetic from Apollo, and poetic from the Muses. He says, we on our part must prove that such madness or transport is given by the gods for our greatest happiness, and our proof will not be believed by the merely clever, but will be accepted by the truly wise. First, then, we must learn the truth about the soul divine and human by observing how it acts and is acted upon. And the beginning of our proof is as follows. Every soul is immortal. And then he goes on to discuss the immortality of the soul. Obviously, along with the belief in the immortality of the soul, Iamblichus accepts from Plato his theory of rapture. Iamblichus' examples show his beliefs are clearly in the Platonic tradition. As against Porphyry, Porphyry who once again wants to base these events in a biological framework, Iamblichus wants to highlight their supernatural origin. He's also keen on showing Porphyry how much the latter has strayed from the teachings of the godfather Plato. So um, my questions are pretty simple. Um, you know, I mean, what do you think about this, Ryan, uh, where we're talking about possession, uh, kind of going out of one's senses and that kind of thing? Have you ever had any experience of that? I mean, totally. Um, I think that <laughs> I would say that, like, it is, and I think that this actually, like, meshes very well with, like, the Iamblichian framework that we've kind of set up here. But, like, and Farzana has mentioned this before, too, so I'm kind of bummed that she's not here today. Um, yeah. But, like, I do really, well, A, I'm going to break this up into a few different points. Um, first and foremost, I think that possession maybe not as is described by Iamblichus necessarily, but more in the sense that you are being surrounded and interpenetrated by spiritual third parties, which somewhat direct your actions. I think possession is a lot more common than even the like spiritually esoterically minded like to admit, you know? We've talked, or not admit, but like acknowledge, uh, think about. We've talked a lot about the vast ecosystem, right? That like exists in the above. Um, and just given that vastness and given like how close those things are to us in a lot of times, I think that they like intersect with us a lot. So like, when I'm practicing, um, especially if I'm talking about like purification specifically, um, cause that's something we've like touched on a lot. A lot of the purification that I do will be to try and like become individual prior to an attempt at integration with the greater, you know what I mean? Like drawing into itself, getting those external influences and sort of like pushing them away. Um, Beyond that, though, um, so, so, and again, like, I think that, like, I, I would say most of us at any given time are being surrounded by these things. And I know that's not really what Iamblichus is talking about, but I think that it works with the sort of, like, tiered hierarchical existence of what we've been talking about and, like, how we perceive it. But, like, those are, like, kind of, like, low-level things. But in order to experience that same effect from a something that's closer to the one it often requires breaking out of your senses and i think that it's like really interesting that iamblichus uses pain um so explicitly in that because that's not really something i've ever done or 
would like to, but like, it also reminds me again of like, you know, you think of like the flagellites in like Christian traditions and stuff like that. There is that through line there. Um, I'm rambling a lot. Um, no, that's fine. Um, no, I mean, if you think of uh, when I read this, I was thinking, and I tried to put it into a, a context, but I wasn't able to get there. Of the Sundance, you know, with the Native Americans, right, right, when right. They go on, when they go on a uh, well, there's the Sundance, which of course involves um, several day ritual where one is has. Uh, is tied to a pole, but tied in the sense that there are the bre- the skin of the breast and the muscles of the breast are pierced, and then leather thongs are laced through them, and then those leather thongs are attached to a longer uh, leather thong, which is tied to a pole. And what one does is, uh, for the several days, is push back against it so that the skin is torn away not necessarily torn per se but is pulled away from the skin i'm sorry for the from the from the bones and so this entire and of course one can i mean you can imagine where during that time you're you're not eating you're not drinking anything you know the, the total possession that one must go through and experience through that type of pain must be amazing but I think that 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 occurs in several um, ritual practices. Another um, with the Native Americans again is that when they do go on their uh, vision quest, uh, which is an this is one of the first attempts that when one becomes a, a, a well in those societies is when one becomes a man. Uh, one goes out and seeks a vision quest, which is um, a encounter with one's personal God. And at the end of that, it's it's often occurs that they cut off a piece of themselves, like either a finger or, or, or some other flesh of some kind, as an offering to to the uh, to the deity. So I um, think that type of possession is, you know, where you it's got to be an all-consuming thing. Is part of the the pain? Is it? In, at least in those senses, seems to be part of where you have to be able to withstand the pain and show that you you know you are willing to give ever your all to the God. Do you see it then as like devotional, as like sacrificial, or do you see it as transcendent? Because I'm kind of on the other end. Because I, I again like I've never used pain <laughs> as like a, a method to do this, but like. When we talk about ecstasy, right, um, using, um, you know, like breathing techniques, using sex, using drugs, um, using rock and roll. No, but like, honestly, using music um, <laughs> to like help you get into that ecstatic state. I think of it much more as like a transcendent experience rather than a devotional one, something that allows you to I guess shed the ego is probably really the best way to describe it and push yourself above the like regular concerns of life, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting because like, I don't, I suppose it's ritualistic, you know what I mean? But like, I don't necessarily, and obviously like ritual can be incorporated into that ecstatic Mm -hmm framework but like i don't think it is in and of itself ritual do you know what i mean um so i, I again like i think but it, that does being part of a ritual is that somehow outside? yeah yeah no like i mean but like the act itself i guess is what i'm saying like now it can definitely be part of a ritual a broader one and i, I suppose mm-hmm. anything can be a ritual so it's like yeah maybe not, not the best um way to look at it you know but um but yeah um I think that putting it in that context, like, it makes me think that an important, like, probably the most important part of possession, and we've talked about this a lot before, is that purification, which mm-hmm. I see as 
a release of the ego. Hmm. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, I you know I can see it as a cleansing of the ego, and certainly, it and and the the, the it's interesting to me, and and I kind of want to back up a, a little bit when I have experienced like times of losing consciousness, and this seems to be the ultimate state for for what Iamblichus is talking about, right? Where you totally lose consciousness of who you are, and you. You are completely possessed by the divine. I, you know, I don't. When I thought of this, I thought my own experience with you know blackouts while while I, when I was drunk. I certainly don't want to think of that as being, right, yeah. you know, in being possessed by. But if it is, it would be possessed in a, in a negative way, obviously. Right. But, yeah, and I mean, like, uh, sorry, God. Well, w- would that count? For, do you think? I mean, is is that what Iamblichus is is trying to reach this level of complete and non consciousness? Even though supposedly when I was when I was blacked out, I wasn't. I was literally walking around right. and doing yeah. things which I was not conscious of. Yeah, I mean, I which don't know. It's very bizarre to me to have that kind of experience or to have had that kind of experience. Right. It's actually pretty scary. It's pretty freaky. That's Definitely. why I think yeah. when, when people think of possession, they, they do find it scary. It is something which, you know, borders on, on the horrifying because you, are, you, you talk about ego. Is ego the consciousness that we give up of ourselves? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, like, I think loss of the self or, like, degradation of the self is something that is so very, on, like, a basic level, disturbing to us, you know, Mm -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. given sort of, like, the individualistic culture that we tend to live in, that, that the self is, like, lauded. It's seen as, like, the pinnacle almost um Mm -hmm. i'm not going to say it's divinized necessarily but like i don't know like even think about like just sort of like the mythos of the west it's a lot of times like based on that like rugged individualist who uses their cunning and their i think it's like very culturally ingrained in us to identify very strongly with the self so the idea that that sense of self is degraded and you no longer, not only no longer have control of your own actions, but you are unable to make decisions and comprehend the world as you have in the past. And as you do now, like, I think that that is inherently disturbing to people. That's why I think like zombie movies are so terrifying to, to me, at least. Mm. Mm-hmm. you know, because it's like the, you, know, you always have that scene of the person that's like slowly losing themselves. And it's like, it's always very visceral. It's very deeply disturbing. So when we think about that in the context of, um, of like divine possession, and that that's why I think it would it, it'll be very hard for like the average person in modern society, <laughs> Western society at least, to comprehend, like conceive of or comprehend of possession as a good thing. And um, of course, like that is highly influenced right. by like the exorcist, you know, if I'm being mm-hmm. frank, um, oh, of course. yeah, like that, those, those are like, it's important cultural kind of like frameworks for us. But like, mm-hmm. I think at a deeper level, it's really hard for people to think about possession as divine, um, right. which is why I feel like. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's also difficult for me to not wrap my head around because, like I said, like I do think that, like, oftentimes we are in. I, I always use the word interpenetrated because I think that we also like have an effect on them. But like, there are external forces acting upon us always, um, just as we are always acting upon the mm-hmm. world outside it. But like, that's a little bit less visceral, right? Um, it's a little but bit less. In, like, in most of the in most of the rituals. The goetic rituals, it's it's a commanding of those spirits. Exactly. Those yeah. Spirits do not take control of you, at least from what I, I'm aware of, right? 
Yeah. They're, you, you know, that you, you, you become the, or you at least threaten them saying, well, I'm this God and I'm, I command you to do this. And I guess these spirits are not that smart. So I, I think Matt, um, Matt talked about this earlier. You know, they're not so smart, so they can be kind of bullied around and to do things for you. Uh, but yeah, still, that's, actually, not, that's not possession. No, you and know, that's what I mean. Kind of like, possession like, is, yeah. I feel like it's, and again, this is like postulation, right? This is just, sorry, excuse me. Um, what I kind of feel, what I kind of believe, I can't necessarily point to. Well, I mean, I can point to Iamblichus in, in his sort of like broader frameworks, but like, I see that as like, it's it's a similar effect with like a less advanced being, you know, that's that's how I perceive it anyways. Um, but yeah, um, but then like, what's really then interesting, I think, is it, it like, if we're going to accept the premise and i don't know if we have i don't even know if i have that like it is through this kind of like exaltative ecstatic lo dropping of the ego that allows us to move beyond and above that like i don't know first layer of the hierarchy into like a more purified more divine place where does the bad stuff come from <laughs> Like, because mm -hmm. I also, I, I also believe in the bad stuff, you know what I mean? And of course, when we talk about, it's like sexy almost to think about the bad stuff because of horror movies and stuff. Right. Um, but like, why, why does, how does that framework make sense? I guess is my question. I don't have an answer to that. I'm just thinking uh, out loud. As far as the sexiness? But like, wh where does the openness to the negative come from? Is it through, like, in the way that... You mean in like, culture, in, in our culture, or, or just... No, I mean, like, on a, on a, on like a very real level, like, like yeah, why yeah. does that, like, surround us, you know what I mean? Especially, is, is it... Why I, is the evil around us? Yeah, exactly, which I mean is, like, uh, I suppose that's, like, the question, right? <laughs> um, but, yeah. Well, it, it I, depends um, on how you... I think it depends on how you look at evil. If you actually look at evil as personified as spirits and some and that kind of thing, that's different than if you somehow see evil as a matter of choices, bad and good that people make, and then you know they make really terrible, horrifying choices for all kinds of psych psychological reasons, and you know end up hurting themselves or other people. That could be one way of you, that you look at evil. <clears throat> Another way would be that there, you know, that there are indeed these evil entities, which are somehow waiting to take advantage of you because you have something that they want. We're, I'm reading some a lot of Bruno right now, so that's why he's entering my conversation all, all of this time. But he seemed to believe that, which is really strange to me. He seemed to, I mean, the description. Uh, I should pull it up here, but the description that's given is is that he believed that these demons were literally uh, out there waiting to p possess us so that they could consume us and our lives. Very, very strange. Yeah, and it's... Almost like vamp vampiric type Yeah, uh, and entities. like, I mean... I I and this is like not we're getting off into the weeds here a little bit, but yeah. like I I I do love this kind of stuff. It's like uh -huh. a guilty pleasure, of mine, you know? but like I've seen so so many experiences of people that have had like the more negative, you know, yeah. I'll say like possession adjacent at the very least experiences sure. where there is that feeling of taking of like taking advantage of consumption from this thing and i i just wonder like what why what 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 is the consumption what are they consuming i don't know anyways this we're, we're off topic here let's get back to it well no this actually fits it believe it or not this he does he being at uh Amblicus, does talk about 
demonic possession, contrary to what his uh, peers in in according to, at least according to uh, Emma Clark, he does believe in demonic possession and possession by the dead. Right, which right. is something that n- n- nobody in the uh, Hellenistic world in which he was uh, living believed in or even conceived of. So right. he does believe that there are these evil entities, and the Chaldeans also believed in that, that there were the, these evil entities, and they were literally out to um, not necessarily possess us, but to definitely attack us. I, um, I yeah. use Bruno because Bruno thinks that they're actually out there to consume the life force that we have. Um, uh, have you ever read... Um Probably not. It doesn't seem like it'd be kind of your thing, but it's called Four Elements of the Wise. It's by Evo Domingos Jr., who, again, this is like a Llewellyn Books guy. Um, so he's like very like kind of like into the witchy side of things. Um, but it was a, it's a great book. I loved it. And he talks a lot about those sort of like external entities that surround us. But he and a lot of, I guess, like witches, um, people on like the more magical, overtly magical side of things, um, kind of conceive of them as elemental beings. Um, and he goes into actually quite a like deep, I guess, typology of, of these beings and like how to, how to recognize them when you come into contact with them. Um, and I mean, like, of course there's different ways of perceiving the same thing. So I just wonder if like, yeah, it's all, it's all similar. Um, because I, well, you, uh, you say, you say witchy as though that's a, a bad word. And, and no, no. Me, I mean, like, not, yeah, yeah. no, it's not at all. I, and to, to anyone listening, that's, that's I have a lot of, yeah, I have a lot of respect for, for witches. Yeah. I mean, and that, of course that's how I like got into all of this in the first place. Really? You know, I was through that. Like, well, I mean, like. Kind of, I suppose. Mad magi- I don't know if you if you think that a magician is different than a witch, <laughs> which I guess I do. But um, but like you know, it was like there was that time when I was like, oh, it was actually when I started to see uh, Wicca um a lot. And this was like in high school when I was like, oh, there is like respected ways of like respected traditions of spiritual understanding that incorporate like you know, magic and stuff like that. And so like, yeah, like that was just a very, that knowledge was powerful for me in the first yeah. place that like, yeah. it really like helped me to like take that step to like, I'm actually going to try this. Like, you know, I've, I've seen like smart people that I respect who have said that they've tried this and that it's worked for them. So like, I'm going to, I'm going to find my own way, you know? Mm-hmm. No. So like, I'm no, by no means saying that it's not, yeah, yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's just not Neil Platon. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. Right. Yeah. yeah. And but I, yeah, I mean, I've I learned a lot, and I'm learning a lot from from witches that I that I read. Yeah. Um, and so I find it very, very f- uh, important for for several respects. To me, the most important part is that here these were persecuted people who were put to death literally for their beliefs and their practices in the name of supposedly something that I used to believe in, which is wrong. But also that their their wisdom is is very, very profound. Their insight into um, not just human nature, but in, in into nature is very, very profound. Yeah, so, yeah I've been trying I definitely to, have yeah. a lot of respect. I've been trying to do more reading on... Um... I, I don't know if I've ever talked about this before, but like my background's Ukrainian. Hmm. Um, and there's like a really rich tradition of like the Vidmaya, the, the sort of like village witch, the forest yeah. witch, you know, that's like very important and in Ukrainian yeah. culture. So I've been trying to like do some reading on that. And yeah, there is like such, such wisdom, especially in like understanding your place in the world. I think that right. it's like a very good framework to kind of like put you in that. Cause one thing I'll say about Neoplatonism, um, and it's funny cause like, this is actually the exact opposite of <laughs> the point of what any Neoplatonic writer I've ever read is trying to get at. 
But like there is a degree of egoism, I think, that can creep in to Neoplatonic thought because A, you are God, you know, at the end of the day, or you at least are part of God. And B, like there is that sort of, I don't want to say elitism, but like that's the word I'm going to use that like sort of like. We are the, 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 we, we eat the men, the men eat meat where the, the babes drink milk. You know what I mean? Like, I think that there's a yeah. degree of that that comes along with it. And I yeah. think that, like, the, the more occult side of things, the more, like, witchy side of things is, it's, it's more holistic in your thought. Or egalitarian. You, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, like, it makes sense. Like, when you think about who these guys were that were writing, like, they were, Oh, they were imperial aristocrats. aristocrats. Yes. <laughs> like they were, yes, exactly. they were aristocrats in the most powerful empire ever to have existed mm-hmm. in history. Well, actually, I mean, you know, that's uh, the history bros will probably hate that one, but there's an argument for it at least. Um, <laughs> yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, but like, yeah, it's um, yeah. it's. So it's like, I think it's important to remember context when you're thinking about these things. And again, it doesn't have anything to do with possession, but like, there, there's. There's multiple paths to truth, I guess. It's yeah. Bottom line. Kind of, kind of back to, yeah, no, I totally agree with Anyways, this, yeah. much, much of what you say. Um, I, I found the quote by um, Bruno. I thought I'd read it because it's, it's just so striking. Yeah, yeah. His, uh, his own explanation of such phenomena, and he's talking about the phenomena of. Um, sickness, and sometimes uh, psychological illnesses, refers to both the inferior melancholic humor of the man, who, because he is devoid of spirit, is especially vulnerable to demonic possession and to the actual intervention of demons. These, possessing a body, affections and passions no less than man, are in search of whatever can constitute a source of nourishment or pleasure, and therefore of a matter capable of attracting their action. What makes all of this possible is, on the one hand, the present presence within us of a spirit which has a varying degree of purity, and on the other, the fact that this spirit, whose link with our imagine, imagination can be taken for granted, is indistinguishable from the passive aspect of our consciousness. It is this consciousness which may or may not allow the establishment of the demonic vinculum or bond, depending on how much resistance the cognitive faculties are able to offer. According to the infinite diversity of physical constitutions and to the quality of spirit which we can artificially and sometimes wrongfully modify, for example through certain foods or particular ointments, it is possible for a spirit to take control of us, attracted by our own melancholic humor, just as the world's soul can be attracted by a matter which is disposed to receive a certain influence. Interesting stuff. I mean, so it's, symp- I, so it's sympathetic for Bruno, like in the same way we talk about like using symbol and ritual to better prepare yourself for ascension. Um, especially when you're dealing with like, you know, planetary deities and such, the like the melancholic humor is almost the, Mm -hmm. you know, symbol of the, the demonic, I suppose, which I guess makes a lot of sense to be perfectly honest with you. Like I, and even in terms of like your health, right? Like we know scientifically that your body, it is less able to fight disease it's less able to like move properly your blood flows less um robustly when you are feeling down like when you're depressed like stress these things like you know if a stressed person supposedly dies 10 years before their non-stressed counterpart like why wouldn't it be the same on the spiritual level you know what i mean Mm -hmm. it also most makes me think about um ah, i brought this up like a while back i um, I don't know if you remember, but um, we were, when we were talking about sort of like our experiences with darkness, you know, that aspect of 
movement and like chaos of like quick, rapid miasma, I guess is probably the best word to describe it. But like that, that, and that, that as opposed to tranquility and stillness, you know, when I, again, when I think of like that, that ego death, for lack of a better term that we were talking about before that, like ecstatic purification, yeah. that is stable. You know what I mean? Like that is static. I, I'm not going to say static, but like, I think that's the best word I could describe. So I will say static. Um, Whereas like that, like that chaos, that movement. And again, when you're like, when you're depressed, when you're down, your mind is often racing. You often have like a hundred things on your plate. You don't know what to do with yourself. You're thinking about like all these things that I could be doing, but I don't do any of them because it's just overwhelming. There's that like chaotic movement um, Mm -hmm. and speed almost. Um, So I don't know. I agree. That's how I'm like, I'm glad we had this conversation because it's helped me like work some things out. That's how I'm coming to kind of think about it um, Mm. more and more, you know? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, I'd like to, um, you know, what's the difference or look at what's the difference between like a mystical unity with God and what Iamblichus is talking about with uh, divine possession. Is there a difference, do you think, or is it something? I mean, is his his seems much crazier. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's it's much more terrifying. Although you know, I mean, they do people. If you read the mystical works, descriptions of mystical experience, they sometimes sound pretty terrifying. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't know. That's tough. Well, I mean, like, if I ever achieve unity with God, I'll be sure to let you know. Um, <laughs> but well, when you've had when you've had experience no, like, these, yeah, no, I, these yeah. unitary experiences, yeah, uh, and, and you've talked about them, am, right? Am I correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you've talked about them, and you're it's, and when you have them, are they? terrifying or have there been terrifying aspects to them where you are, yes. are coming into the presence of a reality which is so profoundly different than yours that you know you actually where they talk about fear and trembling definitely yeah yeah okay yeah definitely it's definitely like i i've, I've brought up this experience in the past and i think that it's like the best it's definitely like been one of my most visionary i guess experiences like most evocative experiences was the like snake in the sky incident i call it where like there was just this like being of such incredible size and it was actually the size that like really struck me where i was like this thing is overwhelmingly large and it like just made yeah it makes you feel so small which is terrifying you know what i mean it's like almost there's like almost this feeling of (laughs) this is gonna sound flippant um forgive me but the way i almost think of it is like you know like those images of sea monsters where there's Mm -hmm. like just a giant maw that's gonna just like overtake a ship or something like that and the ship like never had a chance you know that's almost what it feels like i think that that's probably the best image i can i can evoke when i talk about my my feelings of fear at least specifically in my experiences is like a feeling of at least initially smallness is probably Mm -hmm. the best word but powerlessness would probably be a better word and then like i mean usually those experiences lead to like better understandings of either where that fear come from or like ways to push yourself beyond that for fear or realizing that that fear is not entirely founded, but like, yeah, there's definitely fear. And like, again, like I think of like when I am, this is like a very lame example that everyone would use, but like 
think about any any mention of someone seeing an angel in the Bible, you know? I, is there any examples of angels being like, oh, and I was overwhelmed by their beauty? It's like, no, they were, everyone's terrified. Mm. Um, and it's, I think, I think it comes from that. Yeah, that's interesting because in, 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 in Iamblichus and I think the Neoplatonic tradition, they do talk about the beauty. There, there, there is the, I mean, beauty is one of the characteristics of the ultimate reality. And it's through beauty that one can come to it. To Definitely. The, at least for, for Plotinus, anyway. And I Definitely, believe but like, that's, that, that is after the initiation, though, right? Like, that's after the beholding, I'll say. And I like that word, you know, the beholding of the power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, and it comes from the comprehension of that power, I think, is where that, where that vision of beauty comes from. Because when you're standing next to it as yourself with your current ego, mm. it's just not something you experience day to day, which I guess is my point. Like, it's just outside yeah. our yeah. normal comprehension. So it is something outside of you. I, I, yeah, I mean, that's how, I, that's how I've always... Yeah. I got, that is how I have always experienced and perceived these things. You know, now, I'm not going to say that that is the truth, but that well, is my no, understanding that's fine. of I mean, truth, I think we all see our own ex aspects of reality. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, like I said, there's multiple... But I was, I was trying to get to, to the notion that it was outside of you. It wasn't yeah. just psychological. No, I mean, like, again, like that's always how I perceived it. It's always like out coming in, or probably like above coming to below would be the better... Framework, mm -hmm. but like, yeah, that's uh, definitely. I, I think that's important uh, for for Amblicus, at least. He he thinks these things are real, and that they're outside of us. These entities, whether they're, yeah. demon they're demonic, whether they're demonic or or divine. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Yeah. Um. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just, I mean, I think we're probably can, at a yeah, point can wrap I'm up. down to um, cut it whenever but, you want. But, but um, I want to carry on this uh, conversation next time. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I really, I'm, I'm I interested get into to see these, what the others yeah, have to he's say gonna, about it. Yeah, he's going to start talking. We're right. Yeah, hopefully they'll show up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> If you're listening to this, Farzana, come next time. Matt, Please. come on, what the heck, you guys? Yes. <laughs> um, um, but I'd like to get into the four types of mania that Plato talks about. Yes, which, I which actually... Are erotic, oh, telestic, which is uh, having to do with uh, mystery cult, prophetic, and poetic. He will... Uh, Iamblichus starts talking about the prophetic, not so much the erotic. And the, somewhat the telestic, but I'd like to get into those and and yeah, see yeah, actually, are they when you, really when you, applicable these days? Do you think or when, go you, ahead. when you brought up when you brought up them up in the beginning? I was like, yeah, that was one of the one of the strings I wanted to pull that we never got to. Um, That's all right. But this I, is, this the, is this like I, I talk about this. You guys are like the uh, one time a week I get to really discuss these things. So like, man, I just there's a lot I always am like pulling out. I'm, well, I'm glad. Um, I'm glad that you're. I mean, me too. Here, yeah. you know, you know. Yeah, me so too. And for the listeners at home, find find your people to have these conversations with. It is helpful, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, or um, leave comments at our yeah. uh, YouTube channel, and we will respond. Yeah, really totally. appreciate it. Thank. And that's a wrap for the Leap Day 2024 installment of the Eamblichus Reading Group. It's a fascinating topic, so we'll continue in our next episodes to explore divine and demonic possession. I'm looking forward to your comments on tonight's episode, so keep them coming. Until next time, have a great day.